This module will introduce you to basic radiological interpretation of periodontal disease. It will provide an introduction to the objectives of imaging of periodontal disease and review bitewing and periapical radiography and their application to evaluate periodontal bone. These references will provide a comprehensive review of this topic. Clinical assessment of periodontal disease includes a thorough medical and dental history, identification of local factors and signs of inflammation, measuring the probing depths, and assessing the pattern and extent of attachment loss. These clinical assessments will guide the design of the radiological examination. Radiographs serve as an adjunct to the clinical examination. In addition to assessing the bone loss and providing a record of the bony changes, radiographs help you identify local etiological and anatomic factors of relevance to treatment planning. Note that the information from a radiograph does not substitute for a thorough clinical examination. On radiographs, you can determine the pattern of bone loss and its severity, assess the adequacy of the bony support for function, and identify local etiological factors including calculus and faulty restorations. Additionally, you will also identify other pathology of significance including caries, periapical disease, and root resorption. Most of these diagnostic objectives can be accomplished with periapical and bite-wing radiography. In a small subset of cases, we will use cone beam computed tomography to characterize the bony changes in three dimensions. Panoramic radiography may be adequate to provide a simple assessment of periodontal bone level. However, intraoral radiography is typically performed when more critical assessment is needed. A quick review of the bite-wing technique. We make separate projections for the premolar and molars. The sensor is placed parallel to the long axis of the teeth. The beam is directed through the interproximal spaces and directed downwards at an angle of approximately 5 to 10 degrees. Assessment of the interdental bone level in the posterior dentition is better done on bite wing radiographs. Periapical radiographs often underestimate the amount of periodontal bone loss. A full mouth radiographic series with periapical radiographs and bite wing radiographs that are properly exposed and positioned will provide adequate information to assess periodontal bone levels. There are certain limitations to radiological imaging of periodontal disease. First, projections such as periapicals, bite wings, and panoramic are two-dimensional in nature and can underestimate the bone loss. On these projections, the interproximal bone is well projected. However, the facial and the lingual bone is not projected as well. Most importantly, radiological imaging only demonstrates bone and does not demonstrate any soft tissue relationships, which are important components in assessing periodontal disease. Now let's examine the radiological appearance of interdental bone on periapical and bite wing radiographs. Let us focus on the posterior region and in particular the interdental bone between the mandibular molars. Outline the lamina dura adjacent to the teeth and continue on to the interdental bone. The interdental bone should be corticated and flat. Note that in order to appear adequately radiopaque, the X-ray beam should traverse through a sufficient thickness of the cortex of the interdental bone. To evaluate the height of the interdental bone, draw a line between the cementoenamel junctions of the adjacent teeth. The interdental bone should normally be 0.5 to 2 millimeters below this line. Note that the edges of the interdental bone are sharp and that the adjacent PDL space is of uniform width. The appearance of the interdental bone in the anterior region is similar. The interdental bone should be corticated and the cortical border is continuous with the adjacent lamina dura. However, unlike in the posterior region where the interdental bone was flat, the interdental bone in the anterior region is slightly rounded to narrow depending on the width of the interdental space. Similar to the posterior region, the interdental bone lies 0.5 to 2 millimeters below the line connecting the CAJs of the adjacent teeth. Now let us consider how these appearances change with the development of periodontal disease. In gingivitis, you have inflammation of the gingiva with no bony changes. Thus, there will be no radiographic changes that are apparent. It is important to recognize that patients who have dramatic and marked changes of gingival inflammation could have radiographic 
examinations that demonstrate no changes in the periodontal bone levels. Once periodontitis has been established, bony changes will start to manifest on the radiographs. It's important to remember that these bony changes reflect not just the current inflammatory bone loss, but also past pathological changes. Importantly, the severity of the bone loss does not correlate with the clinical manifestations. Once periodontitis is established, radiographs will demonstrate either horizontal or vertical bone loss, interdental craters, loss of the buccal and lingual cortical plates, involvement of the furcation, and sometimes periodontal abscesses. The most common pattern of bone loss is horizontal bone loss, where the margin of resorbent bone remains perpendicular to the surface of the tooth. This radiograph demonstrates a horizontal bone loss pattern. Note that the level of bone, shown in yellow, continues to remain parallel to a line joining the CEJs of the adjacent teeth, shown in blue. In vertical bone loss, the bony defect is in an oblique direction, creating a trough in the bone adjacent to the root. Depending on the extent of the bone loss, vertical bone loss is often categorized as one, two, or three wall defects. In a three wall defect, both the buccal and the lingual plates are intact. In a two wall defect, either the buccal or the lingual plate is lost. Both the buccal and the lingual plates are lost in a one wall defect. However, remember that radiographs are two dimensional images and the buccal and lingual plates can only be inferred. These radiographs demonstrate vertical bone loss. Note how the margin of bone is oblique and at an angle to the tooth surface. In addition to categorizing the pattern of bone loss, radiographs also help assess the severity of bone loss. Mild bone loss is when there's approximately two millimeters of bone loss. Moderate bone loss is when the bone extends to approximately 50% of the root length. And bone loss greater than this level is considered severe. The earliest changes of periodontal disease will start at the interdental bone. You will notice a loss of cortication of that interdental bone and the edges of the interdental bone start to get rounded off with widening of the periodontal ligament space. In the initial phases of bone loss, there is a crater-like defect in the interdental bone, leaving the facial and the lingual plates intact. As demonstrated, these plates absorb adequate photons to appear radiopaque and mask the underlying crater defect. Likewise, the facial and lingual plates may mask large vertical defects. Thus, in addition to identifying the interdental bone, also identify the facial and lingual bone levels where perceptible as separate. Be familiar with the appearance of different levels of resorption along the buccal and lingual plates. Careful examination will demonstrate two distinct radiopaque edges. This radiographic appearance should prompt clinical assessment with periodontal probings around the circumference of the tooth. Next, evaluate the region of the furcation. For each multi-rooted tooth, trace the periodontal ligament space along the root to the area of the furcation. Determine the level of bone in the region of the furcation. In addition to evaluating the periodontal bone, also identify local etiological factors that may be causative in nature. These include areas of calculus, migrated teeth, and overhanging restorations. As previously stated, radiographs depict both the current state of periodontal bone as well as the past inflammatory history. This radiograph demonstrates the periodontal bone in a patient with periodontitis that was successfully treated. Note how the alveolar crest is corticated, suggesting absence of current inflammatory bone loss. Most diagnostic objectives of imaging periodontal disease can be accomplished with periapical and bite-wing radiographs. These radiographs are two-dimensional in nature and have an inherent limitation of superimposition. Note the seemingly normal periodontal bone levels adjacent to the mandibular molar. CBCT imaging shows a vertical defect on the distal aspect of the molar that was not detected on periapical radiography. Nevertheless, the combination of clinical information and radiological information from two-dimensional periapical and bite-wing radiography 
continues to be adequate for diagnosis and management of periodontal disease. However, when this information is inadequate or conflicting in nature, CBCT imaging could provide valuable information. So to summarize, we reviewed the diagnostic objectives of imaging for periodontal disease. We reviewed the radiographic imaging techniques and their specific application to evaluate periodontal bone. We reviewed the normal appearances of periodontal structures on intraoral radiographs and the basic radiological appearances of periodontal disease. And with that information, you should be able to categorize the pattern and severity of periodontal bone loss in this patient.